Have you ever been a part of something that, though it once served as a deep place of belonging, eventually felt like you no longer fit in that same community? Or maybe it even became unsafe for you to be in spaces that you once belonged. I'm talking about anything, like a religion you grew up in, a social club you joined, friend groups between people with similarly marginalized identities, a bunch of guys you used to go camping with, or even the career you chose. Like at some point you realize that whatever script you were following was damaging to you in some way, or maybe you'd just grown beyond it. So then it became clear that you needed to move on. If it was really bad, escape might have even been a more accurate word. And to do so, you had to fully separate and dissociate from the original thing until you realized far later at some point that you actually still wanted and needed some of what you gained from those original identities and spaces. Well, my name is Brandy and I have been there. Welcome to This Plus That, a show about connecting the seemingly unconnectable and why it matters. I'm your host, and in today's conversation, I talk with Abra Dresdale and Adam Brock of Regenerate Change about the intersections of fractals plus free will. Abra Dresdale is a cultural artist, visionary educator, and consultant in the fields of regenerative social design, prison food justice, and Jewish earth-based traditions. She has a new book out within the last couple of weeks, actually, called Regenerative Design for Changemakers, a social permaculture guidebook. It's an essential guide for organizational changemakers, consultants, higher education students, and transdisciplinary educators pursuing a regenerative future for the 21st century. And Adam Brock is a Denver-based cultural artist practicing regenerative social design. For over a decade, he's worked to create the conditions for regenerative relationships among individuals, grassroots initiatives, and institutions throughout the country. Adam also has a book published in 2017 called Change Here Now, Permaculture Strategies for Personal and Community Transformation, a recipe book for social change inspired by the more than human world. Their additional experience and wisdom, which is very vast, as well as links to their books, can be found in their extended bios in the description of this show and in the episode show notes on my site, of course. But today, we discuss the scripts we've each been born into and how those scripts have either opened doors for us or kept us locked in cages but also what it means to practice radical agency and self-empowerment inside of those cages, even if they're within the tightest and most constrained circumstances, and how we can critique the stories and identities we've been given without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, what it means to live yes and lives, full of adaptation and creative visions for the future. You'll also hear us talk about how they teach a kind of social biomimicry, what Abra calls the principle of positive contagion, a way that we create our own weather patterns and exhibit personal agency, power, and free will, how healing can ripple to the past, which is one example of fractals, how we can create a yes where the world has told us there's a no, like one really beautiful story about a man locked in prison who nonetheless found a way to run the Boston Marathon, how tender and exhausting it can feel to constantly have to reassert your own agency in spaces where your whole humanity isn't seen, the alienation we've all experienced in our early spiritual traditions, but how we've each grappled with reintegrating ancient technologies in a way that reflect ourselves and our values today, including the ability to discuss how some of our new traditions, even permaculture, often include problematic practices, and so much more. In the conversation, you might hear some talking in the background as Abra was in a shared space next to someone talking kind of loudly. And a few times, Adam mentions Turtle Island, which is just a reference to the indigenous name for North America. Abra also alludes to someone named Asia, who also works with Regenerate Change, and she's referring to Asia Dorsey. I'll add her also in the show notes, but you're going to get to hear her in an upcoming episode that I'm very excited about. But for now, I think that covers it. Enjoy my conversation with Abra and Adam on the intersections of fractals plus free will. Adrian Marie Brown in Emergent Strategy says, we need to move from competitive ideation, trying to push our individual ideas to collective ideation, collaborative ideation. It isn't about having the number one best idea but having ideas that come from and work for more people. When we speak of systemic change, we need to be fractal. Fractals, a way to speak of the patterns we see, move from the micro to macro level. 
The same spirals on seashells can be found in the shape of galaxies. We must create patterns that cycle upwards. We are microsystems. We each hold contradictions. My shellac nails versus my desire that no one do the toxic work of nail painting. My family travel versus my desire to not use fossil fuels, etc. Our friendships and relationships are systems. Our communities are systems. Let us practice upwards. Hmm. So for both of you, what contradictions do you feel like you're sitting with in your own lives? And either one of you can start. Thanks for that question, Brandy. Yeah, two immediately occurred to me. One is just the overculture of living in late stage capitalism. And that being just a rampant set of exploitative practices and paradigms. And I conform to them because I am living within this society. And at the same time, uh, so many of my ideals, particularly, you know, in my, my twenties and thirties have been, uh, extremely mm, contradictory to the practices and paradigms of capitalism. Mm. And it feels really challenging to um, live a life that's not separationist, that's not isolationist or back to the land. Um, and yet uh, trying to transform the system while living within the side of the system. And so I feel that tension every day when I, you know, go grocery shopping and something minutia, like picking out plastic containers of berries to um, numbing out to different forms of campaigns or go fund me's to causes that I deeply care about. Um, but I just feel so overwhelmed of where to put attention and resource. So I feel that tension inside my body so frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, this one is, is somewhat related, but, uh, I'm turning 40 in a few weeks. I am going to have a child for the first time in December wow. through my body. Um, and so there is a little bit of, um, a what's the opposite of dilation, like a crystallization that's happening for me of like centering in nest and home and family. And yet as a change maker and an idealist, so many of my aspirations are, are worldly and have been strategically focused on, um, fractal impact, right. From like self to community, to system, to culture. Mm -hmm. And yet my, my attention and ability to attend to these different fractals is, um, really constrained just by my biology and where my, my energy needs to be, um, concentrated to, to make this healthy life and this new chapter in my family. So I'm, I'm holding that contradiction as well. Yeah. Beautiful. Adam, what about you? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think Abra aptly summed up the, the overall hypocrisy or contradiction of, you know, just, just being, uh, someone living in the United States and having to get by and also, uh, trying to make a difference We're we're inevitably going to have one foot in the present and one foot in the future and always straddling that line and, and negotiating that those paradoxes in, in any number of ways. So, yeah, I mean, I think for me right now, some of the ways in which that, that feels very present is in, you know, so, so much of my work, our work at regenerate Change is about connection, connection to other humans. And, you know, in my book, I talk about community, being the conditions of us needing to rely on each other. And, uh, in many ways I try and to create, I try and create those conditions with my local community here. And in other ways, I think, uh, I very much still appreciate and value my ability to, to, uh, to be free and to be independent of needing other people or other people, uh, you know, ha- having to fall in line with, with other people's ideas and choices. Um, you know, I, right now I only live with my partner and most of my adult life I've lived with anywhere between two and eight roommates. Um, and it's really hard living with a bunch of people. Um, it's, it's, you know, almost like dating a bunch of people at once and it requires so much communication and, 
and negotiation and compromise. Um, and I also really love it. Um, but at this point I'm also appreciating the, the freedom that comes from just having this kind of micro family unit, um, and, and the spaciousness that comes with that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one example. Yeah. I love all those answers. I feel all of that deeply myself, of course. And there's that something you said a second ago, Adam made me think of there's something in sacred economics, uh, by Charles Eisenstein, where he talks about how, if you want community, you have to be responsible. Like you have to be responsible to other people. So there's a dependence on other people, right. Uh, whilst, well, so like learning and interdependence while also living alone for me is a consistent, uh, tension that I hold also. And you know, a lot of what he talks about also is of course, like giving, you know, giving culture and how that creates community. But we of course still live inside of capitalism, like you, but both you and Abra were saying. So, uh, and you know, I think being folks who have to sort of find a way to survive and make money that it's, yeah, it's always an awkward tension. So thanks for answering that. I, would love to hear y'all say more though about what you do in the world. So I think you mentioned Regenerate Change, but that's the organization y'all help uh, co-facilitate with some others. And I'd love to hear you just describe what that is. Sure, I can kick us off. Um, so Regenerate Change, uh, we're an organization. We do education consulting and network weaving, uh, both virtually and bioregionally in the two places that our team resides, which is uh, here where I am in the Mahikinatuck Valley and occupied Mohawk and Lenape territory, also known as the Hudson River Valley of New York. Um, and Adam, where are you in Asia located? We are in uh, the Platte River watershed of occupied Ute, Cheyenne and Arapaho territory. Uh, AKA Colorado's front range. And so there's five of us on the team between these two bioregions and, um, Regenerate Change was co-founded by Jasmine Fuego and myself in 2017. And since that time, we've been uh, connecting and teaching change makers in regenerative social design, um, different forms of what people might know as permaculture, but apply to social landscapes instead of physical landscapes mm. um, and supporting uh, change makers from you know, educators to community activists and organizers to uh, directors and and managers do their work more effectively, joyfully, and ultimately wholly. So, so much wholly, W-H, wholly, uh, <laughs> shifting from fragmentation uh, at every Perhaps level of society. Yeah, that's definitely <laughs> like our internal conversations, yeah, but not sure. our, <laughs> our external messaging. Um, but I do think everyone on the team has a deeply um, spiritual and ancestral imperative mm -hmm. in this work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just helping shift from fragmentation whether it's it's in our nuclear family units to our communities to our places of employment to you know global systems change and how do we move from the legacy of fragmentation we've inherited from you know settler colonialism and patriarchy and all the all the things that we know are so oppressive that have been divisive um, and and kind of helping each other shift from myopic worldviews to seeing in holes and understanding how nature works systemically and how do we apply that inherent intelligence um, and efficiency and resilience to our human lives, knowing that we very much are nature and there's uh, a certain level of, of relearning and reskilling that we need to do that we lost just even the last handful of generations. So yeah, that's, that's a slice of, of what we do. Adam, what do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you pretty much said it, Abra, you know, sometimes I think about our work as, uh, using, uh, using the, the wisdom of the more than human world to heal our personal and interpersonal relationships. Um, that's, that's kind of what it comes down to. And, and so that's everything from our own internal relationship with ourselves and maybe our, uh, narratives that we've been telling ourselves about what we are, aren't capable of, um, to our relationship with, uh, our coworkers, to our relationship with those in power, to our relationship with, uh, our ancestors and future generations. Um, 
but, but ultimately it, what it all comes down to is we, we support people in healing their relationships so they can be more effective at making change. Yeah. And using it's like biomimicry, but instead of uh, applying nature to buildings and architecture, it's applying nature and ecosystems and the designs within those two human relationships. Exactly. Yeah. And often with, said social biomimicry is the field uh, we're invested in. Yeah. With yeah. the recognition that like, it's, it's, it's obvious when we say it, but I think in day-to-day practice, we forget it, that, you know, we are animals, we are, we are products of the ecosystem and therefore like we behave in ways that are, are mimics or fractals of how all ecosystems behave. So when we, we, we're social organisms, when we get together, we mimic the same patterns that, you know, ants do or bees do, or, uh, or, you know, bonobos do. Um, so, uh, it's, it's not, it's not just a metaphor. It's, it's very real, just like remembering our aliveness and remembering how, uh, other species aliveness can, can help us remember our own aliveness. Yeah. And so you mentioned fractals again, will y'all describe for someone who might not know what a fractal is? A fractal is a pattern that repeats across scales. Uh, so it is uh, a pattern, any, any kind of way of energy and matter being shaped that you can see, um, on one level and on another level. Um, and so that could be different scales in space, like in the quote you read, uh, from Adrian Marie Brown, the, the spiral pattern that we see in a seashell in the shape of our galaxy. Um, or it could be patterns in time, you know, from like the, the pulsing patterns of, uh, activity and rest, uh, that happen on a daily basis and a weekly basis and a monthly basis in our own lives and in natural systems. Right now, uh, I'll just say real briefly, I'm, I'm really into geology. I'm, I'm reading this beautiful book about geology and it's, and it's helping remember like the fractal patterns, not just at the level of like year to year, season to season, but like over eons, over millions of years, um, and how the, the earth itself, you know, that the rocks have their own life cycle of mm. forming mountains and eroding down in, in these, it's, it's like the earth breathing over like a hundred million years. It's, it's amazing. What a beautiful image, the earth breathing. I, yeah, I, uh, actually was just going back through some stuff earlier today that I was really into a few years ago and ran across the book, uh, a brief history of nearly everything by Bill Bryson. And there's a part in it where, you know, he, he's talking sort of about a lot of the ologies and how they came to be basically. And there's one on geology and he's talking about how Denver, where both you and I live, uh, in the surrounding area is sort of like, uh, it's like bread. And then there's a, a crispy crust and a, a soft center, which doesn't make you feel all that secure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what's, what's the book you've been reading? Uh, it's called Annals of the Former World, and it's by a New Yorker staff writer named John McPhee. It came out, I don't know, like 20 years ago or so, and it's an anthology of books he wrote like since the 80s. So I'm sure a lot of the science in it is dated, but it's basically he's a journalist and he's following these four different geologists across the country, like following uh, the Interstate Highway 80 and like looking at the geology in each of those places and then telling the story of the history of geology through that. And then telling the story of those individual geologists, like their biographies. And so it's just like the way he's telling the story is also this fractal of like narratives at these different levels of time. Um, yeah, it's, it's just really poetic. Yeah. I will include that in the show notes, a link to that for sure. And it also kind of answers a question I often ask, which is, are you mashing any other seemingly dissimilar topics together and are they getting you excited? So geology is a cool, it's still nature, but it's, it's a different sort of segment, uh, a different lens to look at nature through. So that's super cool. So, okay. So how do, I think I've heard you sort of address it, but how do fractals relate to the work that you're doing? Ava, go for it. Yeah. So, um, I think, well, to go back to, to Adrian Marie Brown, she has this really beautiful quote in emergent strategy and um, she says, fractal theory suggests wholeness in our organizers yields wholeness in our futures. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, and she talks a lot about, um, critical connections over critical mass. I think that's from Grace Lee Boggs work and this idea of, um, challenging the paradigm of, of critical mass and, and the growth paradigm and bigger is better. And where can we work uh, what Carol Sanford calls nodally. What are the nodes of intervention, almost like the acupressure points where we can work locally or we can work, you know, interpersonally to actually create, um, a ripple effect of change, right? Mm -hmm. So you really get the right acupressure point and needle together and someone's body reboots entirely. And so, you know, while I think, Adam and I and others on the Regenerate Change team are really visionary and uh, set our sights on, on big change and you know, paradigm shifting and cultural change. We understand that we're just five tiny people, right? But five people who have significance. So where can we work notably that is in smaller self-similar units of social systems that then radiate out and you know, myceliate with other organizations and communities that are doing complementary work so that we can collectively really create um, the collective ideation of, of a more liberatory future, a just future, an ecologically alive future. Um, that is, you know, at least going to be my legacy contribution, hopefully, by the time I leave this planet. Hmm. Yeah, I... In reading some of your resources online, I saw something also that said, it might have even been yours, Abra, that said both modern Western psychology and wisdom traditions from around the world point out that our internal state becomes expressed in our external actions as within, so without. Yeah, so that's a, an, another beautiful illustration of, of fractals. And to you know, link it to our uh, this and that theme of fractals and free will, mm -hmm. I think there's also um, a piece to our work about personal agency and power and understanding like where's the activation points in these different nested holes or fractals? Um, and how can we understand and yoke our significance to actually create the change in our milieu and, and not just settle for that change, but understand what is the, I call the principle of positive contagion. What is the positive contagion between what the three of us are having a conversation about here to what I'm going to have a conversation about next week when I fly across the Atlantic and so on sort of that butterfly and ripple effect and understanding that we do create the weather systems around us. And I think that's where the free will piece comes in uh, and intersects with this sort of uh, fractal ideology. Yeah. And say more, I guess about, uh, I mean, so you sort of described free will as like a, an act of individual agency in the world, but, but yeah. How, how do you see that really intersect with fractals in a way, or, or do you want to describe really more so what free will means for both of you, I suppose? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, and of course everything is subjective, but, but free will is like understanding that we have an internal locus of control. And while there are external factors that shape our world in great ways, my personal belief or cosmology is that, um, we are here as co-creators to co-shape, uh, our present time, our future. And even in my worldview, healing can ripple to the past and past generations. And so mm. that's also another expression of fractals, right? Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. temporal fractals. Um, but yeah, so free will is like, I do have self-determination and as much as the overculture has tried to indoctrinate me and others to think that we don't have self-determination, um, and that we can't actually shape our worlds, our destinies to some degree. I think that that is a fallacy and that's trying to keep us in a mental indoctrination, um, sorry, a mental incarceration, rather a mental carceral state. And so there's something about reclaiming our power, our significance, our agency. And then that's just a creative process. It's like, well, what scale of social change do we want to apply that to? And what is the biggest, brightest, um, outcome that we can imagine using our free will and then putting those things together and, and where does our creativity and our imaginal cells, you know, hit the road of existence on across all these different scales of, of social systems. So I think 
Yeah. It's a little philosophical, but that for me is free will. And I'm sure there's so many definitions out there. Yeah. Welcome um, to my existential world. This is yeah, so perfect. I'm so glad to, to, <laughs> to feed that fire for you. So yeah, that's, that is what, um, I think of, uh, you know, in this particular moment in August of 2021, as we're having this conversation and my thinking is all of ours is always evolving. And so if, you know, you asked me this three months later, I would probably give you a different definition of my a comprehension of free will. Right. Adam, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, first of all, it's impossible to talk about free will without being philosophical. I think it's a <laughs> right. very, you know, it's a deep concept when, when you really just even scratch the surface of it. But, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's like, um, I see this work, any work really the the work of being human is, is a dance, uh, between expressing ourselves and responding to our surroundings. Um, and, and if we, uh, if we end up leaning too much towards either of those things, you know, if, if we, uh, privilege self-expression over what's happening around us, we get out of sync and vice versa. If we're only responding and not acting, we get out of sync as well. Um, and so free will to me is that like that side of the conversation that says, this is, this is who I am. And this is what I have to offer to the, the people and other species around me. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think I kind of want to ask a personal question because this feels so relevant to me. And I feel like the last several months, especially this idea of free will and agency. And I think especially just sort of getting out of victim things. So actually really quickly, Abra, could you define overculture for anyone listening who might not actually have be familiar with that term? Sure. And I, I believe it comes from Clarissa Pinkola Estes, who's an incredible Jungian psychologist and author. Women who run with the wolves. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that's the first time I've heard it, but a lot of folks use it as a way to talk about sort of the matrix, right? Like what are our most people living inside of that is almost like the ocean that we swim in and we don't even see the water. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is one way to understand the overculture. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like, you know, sort of even going back to the beginning of our conversation, that a lot of the things that I learned actually, you know what, even in organizing community, to be quite honest, I think in organizing community, I got to a place at some point where I was, I was so angry at over, over culture or the systemic institutional systems that had us down, uh, that, that I think I think I was operating in such consistent victim mentality. And so I think one of the tensions I've been holding lately is, you know, really related to this around free will and agency and going, okay, yes, those things are all real. We, we are constantly swimming in different ways, you know, like ways that we've been told how to be and ways that we sort of continually engage with other people in the world. And also all, all the things I've been told about how horrible capitalism is, uh, which I still agree with, uh, but like, I still have agency within it, I guess, is the thing that I've really been contending with. And, and the next question I was going to ask was actually related to just sort of grounding it personally. Avery, you said, you know, sort of taking that philosophical and, uh, hitting the road of experience, like where that actually starts to become real and grounded in our personal experiences. And so that for me has been really real that it's sort of, I've just been, I don't have an answer. I've just been sitting with, and, and I think really experiencing a sense of like increased agency and going, these things actually don't have as much control over me as I've given them over the last like decade, you know? And if we're going to, uh, I mean, I, this feels like very sort of Ursula Le Guin, Grace Lee Boggs, Adrian Marie Brown, you know, like this whole lineage of thought of these folks that is going like, if we're going to imagine a different future, we have to actually be able to imagine ourselves outside of that overculture or what have you. And I don't feel like I personally could do that until I was like, oh, I actually, I, I don't want to spend my whole life just going, well, capitalism is X, Y, and Z. So I can't ever actually thrive or 
make money or create even a gift economy or, you know, healthy ecosystems and individually in my own life or, you know, at fractally out from that. So I'd love to hear from both of y'all, if there's something that feels like there's an anecdote where either like free will and agency or that idea of fractals intersecting with that really like became real in your own lives or yeah. you know, something that you've been, yeah, you've been thinking over lately. Yeah. I, I appreciate that question, Brandy. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind is, is actually the work that, that we do through regenerate change has actually been a process of healing for me. Um, you know, you, you were talking earlier about how in activist culture, we were still in some ways perpetuating in, in the level of our own self, these cycles of white supremacy of like overwork of perfectionism of burnout. That's like, that's the, the baseline. Um, and, and for me, you know, I've, I've been a consultant and, and a facilitator for, for several years now, but, uh, in, in a lot of my work before becoming part of the team at regenerate change, you know, I was telling myself a story that I had to show up in those spaces in a way that I thought was professional. Um, you know, which, you know, how I dressed or how I talked or the things I didn't talk about. Um, and I think part of our intentionality with regenerate change it, and, and it gets back to this idea of the fractal, right. Is like our own personal journeys of healing and returning to wholeness should be mimicked in the way we express ourselves in the organization. Um, and so I feel liberated to bring my ancestral lineage into the way I facilitate. I feel liberated to bring my, uh, you know, the, 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 the challenges that, that I'm facing on a day-to-day -day life into the way that I facilitate, I feel liberated to dress the way that makes me feel the best rather than, um, what I think is going to look, you know, what, what's going to give me more credibility to someone. Um, and then the folks that aren't interested in me showing up as my fullest self are, are probably not the folks who should be working with us anyways. Um, and they can find other people that they like to work with. Um, but, but in showing up in that wholeness, we also attract a lot of people who see that, who see that integrity and, and know that that's what they want to be in community with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, I was just before Abra, before you go, I was just going to say that, yeah, th I just actually had an interview with Tyler Thrasher last week. Who's an artist who's doing this stuff, uh, intersecting between science and art in the world. And I was talking about how part of actually doing this podcast for me is a practice actually of holding, I mean, the whole thing is really, I've, I, it started as this, like, well, I think like, I know I've always been interested in the intersection of certain things. I've always been fascinated. And, you know, it's like why I was drawn to take the social permaculture design course. Cause I was just like, Whoa, what are the intersections of social movement and permaculture? That's wild. And that's a class I took of course with Adam a, a few years back. But, um, then I started the, the longer I've been working on this project and doing more of my writing, the more I realized, Oh, this is actually tacking, tackling my own trauma. <laughs> and it became super personal. And like all the ways that I've been told I could only be one particular way, whether it's like having to choose one particular career, even though I was curious about a lot of different things or really more personally, I think again, uh, for me in organizing culture, even in organizing culture, which felt at times a little bit like a, a dogmatic religion that I started to feel like there was only one way to be an organizer and one way to be queer and one way to be an artist. And, you know, and, and I think that's everywhere. And so I think part of what I'm actually doing is realizing that this is repair work in myself of trying to hold, like create a container where I can hold all of those seemingly unconnected or disparate ideas and allow for that. And I was telling Tyler that it's, it's really uncomfortable when you start putting your work out in the world because it gets perceived and there are certain people and, you know, in a culture where that feels like perfectionism and professionalism and, you know, academy and all these things are like credentialed and verified, you, you know, you're, you're an expert and whatever that we're always trying to shoot for that, that I, I started to also in doing this, uh, especially the writing so far that I've been doing 
and putting that out in the world and, and sort of going both quote unquote sides might get real angry at this. Cause I'm floating somewhere in the middle and it's like not enough of either, you know? And, and I came to the same place and talking with Tyler where, you know, it was just like, you can't live your whole life being that hypervigilant, you know, you, you have to just be in integrity with yourself and the right people will find you, I suppose. And, and that's where real community comes from because you're not performing for either, or you're just, you're being an integrity with yourself. Avery, I think you had a, you were going to include something also. Hmm. I just love the contributions you've both uh, made to this conversation. My heart feels so open, just your um, opening vulnerable share brandy about shifting from like a victim consciousness to agency and, you know, where we perceive constraints and Adam, you feeling like this has been such a healing experience for your, your own essence to be expressed and regenerate change. And Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this last piece about intersectionality and, and I think Brandy, it really, um, there is such a default to monoculture consciousness that Mm -hmm. by its, its very nature creates binary splits and it is an either, or, and I think it's deeply healing work and, and the work of those of us who are queer and bridge builders and mixed heritage and bilingual to, uh, bring together disparate pieces into some form of wholeness and congruence, uh, Rabbi Tirza Firestone, who I've recently been studying with, who's actually in your area in Boulder talks a lot about, um, healing intergenerational trauma and, the tools of presence and congruence. And when we um, get connected to others, to the natural world, to our ancestors, um, there's a healing from the intergenerational distress that happens because it creates congruence for us when we can be present with those elements beyond just what's inside our head or our patterning. Mm-hmm. So I think I, I initially said yes to this or that. Cause I was like, this is my slot. Yes. Like social and permaculture and this and that. Um, and, and I think, you know, part of why I also left activist culture is because it seemed, uh, positioned in a way that was antithetical to what is or anti-establishment or, you know, just there was mm-hmm. a, a contrarian energy and, yeah even though permaculture has so many critiques from me and, you know, it's just so many challenges with, um, the way it was founded and the way it was, uh, sort of spread in a missionary type way all over this planet. I'm, I'm not someone to throw out the baby in the bathwater, right? It's like, it's not this or that. Um, and so I think, what I was drawn to about permaculture and social permaculture is it's, it's a positivist attitude. It's a yes. And how do we create solutions? And I think this comes back to the original thread of your question of, um, you know, agency and how do we, how do we create a yes where the world has told us there's a no, there's a closed door or, um, you know, by virtue of the, privileges and identities and, um, uh, yeah, things we were assigned at birth, we have a certain script in our lives and there's doors we can open and there's cages that we're going to be perennially locked in. And, uh, I also have been wrestling deeply, especially COVID felt like such a, a dominatrix, like oppressing us in so many ways. And I know personally, I felt, um, deeply disempowered and had so many profound disappointments in these last 16 months. Um, and so like shifting out of that mentality, I just want to give a really concrete example to go back to your question. And, and, uh, it's not from my personal life, but it's something that I observed in the work that I do in the prison food justice field. And I had a, an incarcerated student who I would come in and teach. And he was really, um, dedicated to being a runner and he was locked up for several years and he wanted to run the Boston marathon. This was back in Massachusetts. And he advocated for himself to the correctional officers and the administrators at this jail that he could and should run the Boston marathon. And they were like, you can't, we can't let you out. There's, you know, all these legal reasons. And, and so what he was able to creatively ideate and then implement was getting uh, the facility to procure a treadmill for him and a screen and for 
whatever, 26.3 miles, I'm not sure what it is. This man ran on the treadmill alongside runners who were running on the pavement in Boston. And it was just the most profound paradigm shift of creating realities, even within the tightest and most constrained and violent conditions that exist in this country. And so I was just incredibly moved by his fortitude and that sense of free will, um, even within a system that creates victims by design. So I just wanted to share that really concrete example, um, with all of our listeners and with you too. Yeah. Thank you. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, there's actually something. So when I was thinking about the idea for this show, I, you know, my, why I, I sat down to think about what my why is. And, you know, I've spent many, many years in branding and marketing and communications work that teach me, of course, that that is sort of the most profound. And we, you know, most folks have heard the Simon Sinek talk and all those things like start with why. Right. And so, but, but it's true. I think a why is the most um, compelling reason to get you up every morning. That's why you keep doing it when it's hard. But the, the why I came up with was uh, to be a show that invites people into places they've been told they don't belong. And so something you said about that in terms of, you know, that there are so many of us, I think because we have such binary thinking or we've been taught such binary thinking, uh, I, I think we learn to accept a, a victim position of, of sort of relegating ourselves to st sticking with one of those things. Right. And, and, Oh, I I'm incarcerated. So I look one particular way, so I can't do X, Y, and Z. And that's what I've been told. And I'm just going to sit with that. And, you know, I think that rings true for, I actually even remembered. So Adam and I sat down, who knows how long ago, I think it was before the social permaculture design course, but, and we were talking about work. I can't, I honestly can't remember, but we were at coffee at the point in Denver. And I remember even then struggling and saying like, you know, I, I feel challenged because I want to do a lot of different things. And I remember you actually saying something that Abra just echoed a second ago, which was, you know, we aren't meant to survive in monocultures. And, and I won't say again, like create a binary there, just like hierarchies, Hierarchies and monocultures, I think, make sense in particular scenarios in different spaces of ecosystems, right? So nothing is good or bad, but I, I remember feeling such a deep sense of relief. And I started to think about like all the ways that, you know, I'd been doing some food justice work, of course, and sort of intersecting with you around permaculture and that sort of thing. And, and, and that idea of polycultures in food made so much sense to me at the time. Just like, well, yeah, of course, like we're meant to eat a variety of foods and not just one particular thing. Why would that not also then apply to my life and my work in the world? And so I just remember that sense of relief, but sort of going back to like inviting folks into places they've been told they don't belong. I think that's similar to me in my, you know, my work and my career and, and Abra, what you said, like that, that idea of just like imagining and creating a yes, where there's a no, I think I've so often, like, it's, it's like in my body. Like I feel like even talking about it, it makes me a little bit emotional. Like all the ways that I've been, I, I've had to sort of create that. Yes. Because there were so many places that I was told that I didn't really belong again. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not a good enough queer. I'm not a good enough organizer. I'm not a good enough, you know, employee. Cause my resume doesn't say so, or, you know, all of those things. And sort of, again, going back to agency, like that idea of like a critical element of self-belief, like when you, when you mm -hmm. have to keep creating your own yeses, there has to be such an internal work of dissecting that victim mentality self-belief because everyone around you is telling, you no, like the, you know, that person you just told us that story of and incarcerated and like how much of a, a mountain of no that you have to crawl through in order to have something like that happen. But like how, how self-empowering that is when you actually realize how much agency you have, even within those constraints. Adam, did you want to add something? Uh, no, I just want to, I want to appreciate you for, for sharing that, which, which I can totally resonate with. And, the. Uh, the like tenderness that comes from, uh, that constantly having to reassert your own, uh, agency, um, in spaces where you're told that there's a certain way to do things and you have to remind yourself, um, that that's not true. 
Mm -hmm. And and that of course is where like power and privilege intersect with this, right? That there's increasing layers of having to tell yourself yes and create yes. When you have more intersecting identities that traditionally are told no, basically like this isn't who you are, this is who you are, what have you. Um, okay. You know what I actually want to ask if you're up for it is that I know Avery, you said this wasn't something that you do and your public languaging, but I, I kind of want to know where in both of your lives, because I know that you come from what I know, I, I think you both come from faith traditions of some sort, and I would love to hear actually what those traditions, what you feel like they have to say about fractals or free will and how those connect. And I think to me that actually in a lot of ways, like that spiritual tangent is a lot of what drives my why. Like the reason I do the work in the world is because it's sort of deeper, however you define it, like, you know, the, the meaning, the existential, the philosophical, like the spiritual, what have you, uh, is really, I think what's behind everything that I do. So I'd love to hear just where that intersects with what, what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that invitation, Brandy. Um, just looping back to our opening talk about contradictions and what are we holding? I think, um, being a white Ashkenazi Jew is such a profound contradiction of thousands of years of intense persecution and oppression and exile and othering and manipulation and attempts at genocide, right? Like we know the story, it's crammed down a lot of our throats when we're kiddos, for those of us who are Jewish. And being a white American Jew, I have a lot of privilege as a white person and lots of Jews for survival reasons have found niches that come with a lot of power and privilege. Um, So that's like a whole like history lesson, right? We're like not actually greedy people taking over the world systems in secrecy. Um, There's, there's so many reasons that, that Jews have economic privilege and there are so, so many poor and working class Jews and they just don't get uplifted and targeted and scapegoated. So there's a whole range, but that's to say that like having an experience of profound privilege in this country, uh, be I have a master's degree, I speak English, I'm cisgendered, I'm white, right? And being Jewish with this history, but the way I'm perceived as a Jew can be can be two-sided, right? Can be, um, uplifted and fetishized and respected and also like targeted and scapegoated and slammed, especially in a, um, behind the scenes kind of way. So it's, it's a really insidious and like sneaky form of oppression that comes in cycles. And so I'll just say that holding that tension my entire life, um, has been a profound experience of having, uh, like the wind of privilege at my back. Like I can, you know, meritocracy, I can make the world and future I want for myself. There's not a lot of like systemic oppression against me besides being a woman and a queer person. Um, and then the flip side is like, um, being terrified all the time of, of present time and, you know, past forms of persecution and where do I feel uh, entrapped? And so I think actually my, my, I guess you could say religious upbringing, although it was pretty like hippie. I grew up in Woodstock, New York in a reconstructionist, uh, congregation of, you know, like one of the most like liberal forms of Judaism. We use a, a gay lesbian Sidor prayer book in our shul from New York city congregation. Um, but you know, I think the sort of identity politics of the internalized oppression plus the privilege created a a why in me that was like, I'm going to make worlds where there isn't one for myself and for those I love. And then, you know, getting to the fractal question of like the actual spiritual tenets that underline the Judaism that I love and practice. I don't identify as a religious Jew. I say I identify as a ritualistic Jew because it is, it is really the earth-based rituals and the songs and like the handcrafts, um, the working with fire and water elements and herbs that like has become my form of Jewish practice that 
grounds me in such a profound way that like enables me, I think, to continue getting up every day when I turn on the news and hear about mass incarceration and climate injustices, et cetera. Um, and so I would just say on a fractal level, like the central teaching, like the holiest holiday, what's in the quote, 10 commandments is rest is Shabbat is taking a Sabbath day. Um, and I've made that central in, in the version of the regenerative social design process that I teach about in the very center is a seventh direction. I haven't seen elsewhere of reflection and integration. I do know the action learning spiral that I think they use at Gaia University has a lot of reflection, but it's a different, a different one. And then we have, um, we have Shemitah coming up, this Rosh Hashanah every seven years. We actually take a whole year of rest and a whole year of sabbatical and, you know, in, um, in an ideal world, economic release and relief of debts and re reclaiming the commons and perennial foodways and local food culture, et cetera. How much that's actually practiced is, you know, questionable. And there's a movement Adam's been a really big part of, um, I have since the last Shemitah cycle of re reviving this, um, and, and every seven times seven years is Yovel. It's a Jubilee year and it's actually a rematriation in what was a land of Israel, um, like during like biblical times and, um, temple times was that the original stewards of land got to return to their land and that land was given back. So there actually, um, could not be long-term forms of colonization and, and land theft. And so, you know, how much these things were practiced, we don't know. We weren't there, right. It's conjecture, but that there are these like basic fractals and values and principles built into my people's cosmology has given me so, so much as a social designer of change and someone who's able to think in, um, you know, I think, uh, Joanna Macy calls it deep time. Um, Winona LaDuke talks a lot about like thinking about time in a broader sense of, of space and generations. And so now having these seeds from my lineage and my spiritual practice has helped me become the kind of visionary and, um, bridge builder that, that I am because of my Jewish heritage and my relationship to it. Yeah, so I know that was long winded, but there was like so much I wanted to weave in there based on this conversation that we're having. Yeah, no, it's a big question for sure. But I love, I love too, just the, uh, those concepts, the concepts you said of, you know, Jubilee and, 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 you know, debt forgiveness and land back, I think to so many people seem like concepts that just came up in the pandemic that you've never <laughs> even heard of it, you know, like in the murder right. of George Floyd and like all the sort of social things that we've been considering over the last year and a half because of the pandemic and, you know, racial justice things that these are actually not only ancient traditions, but also deeply spiritual, deeply related to the, the Christianity and culture underlying a lot of our traditions in America and to see that sort of separation, I feel like, you know, there's just so much, I think, healing there that has to be done between going, wait a second, these are actually our ancient tra traditions and they have real relevance. You know, they're not just, I, I, I feel like for so long in organizing culture, you know, these, I think these concepts seem relatively familiar to a lot of folks, but in general culture, that I think they seem like sort of theoretical, like, oh, what wild, progressive, <laughs> what have you. But these are really deeply spiritual and deeply ancient traditions. And again, like you said, Abra, who knows how how much or to what scale those were practiced, but they're, they're not new, I guess, is what I'm saying is really interesting. And yeah, I think have just become so relevant. And again, like the what that phrase was earlier that you said, the like hitting the road with experience that like so many of us in the last year plus have really gotten a feel for the real need and uh, relevancy of those things has become tangible. I think not just spiritual or theoretical, but like actually tangible in the real world. Adam, what about you? Cause uh, you practice uh, Judaism as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, that is right. Um, and, and it's been a spiritual tradition that I felt 
alienated from for a lot of my adult life because of the the Judaism that I was raised in was it, it wasn't like super religious orthodox, but it was kind of like the next level down from that. Um, and yeah, it just, it never felt like something I could relate to. And, uh, in the last four or five years, I've started to learn more about, uh, a lot of these different ancient technologies and, and a m- modern movements of Jews, a lot of Jews, you know, my age or younger who are, who are reinvigorating them. And, and it finally felt like a Judaism that, that reflected me and my values, uh, and that I could relate to. And so I've, I've really been on a journey of, of reconnecting with that. Um, and, you know, regardless of, of whether or not things like Shemitah or Yovel were ever practiced, the, the important thing to me is not like what historically happened, but the fact that for thousands of years, the story has been the same and that, that thousands of years ago, our ancestors, my ancestors already understood that economic inequality uh, was something that needed to be tempered and we needed technologies to like push that reset button every seven years. They already understood what would happen if we kind of mistreated the land and tried to continue extracting from it too much without letting it rest. They already understood the the importance of wild foods, perennial foods. Um, And, you know, another one of these kind of fractal narratives that that comes from the Judeo-Christian heritage is, is the story of the Exodus. Right. Like I think much more so than Shemitah, this is like a story that's, that's part of our shared cultural tradition in society, but that we don't maybe, especially in these times would be worth returning to of like, uh, of oppression and liberation. And, you know, there's, there's so much in the story of Exodus, uh, of like, the 10 plagues and, you know, Pharaoh, the, the King of the Egyptians, his heart being hardened. And what does that mean? And the parting of the seas. And there's, there's just like so much metaphor. And and as Jews, we get to like reenact and reinterpret and recontextualize that story every single year and celebrating Pesach. And there's always something new there. And there's always something like really profound to remember in retelling that allegory about like, where, where am I feeling oppressed in my life right now? And, you know, as Abra was saying, Jews in America today are fortunate in that we're at the kind of upswing of our historical waxing and waning of being in power and then being um, shunned and forced out of power. So, so we don't have a lot like materially, at least for, for many Ashkenazi white Jews, of course, as, as Abra said, the, the Jewish experience is, is diverse and varied. Um, but for a lot of people who identify as Jewish in America, there were, our, our, our conditions are not like super scary. And there's still so much there in the story of Exodus uh, to learn from, whether that's our own internalized oppression um, and, and narratives or um, how are we showing up or not showing up for people who are under conditions of modern day slavery, literal or, or metaphorical. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Both of those uh, responses gave. I have I have so much to say. The first thing I'll I'll just respond with quickly is I wrote something a couple of years ago. Uh, someone in Denver asked me to write about how I define love. She was asking certain folks who aren't often seen as you know sort of uh, the general picture of you know what we see in couples or what, you know, relationship styles and that sort of thing to define what love meant for them. And, and there was something in it where I said, you know, um, the joy isn't in defining it, it's in chewing it over so that, you know, like where there's just, and I, I think that's what one thing I really love about the idea of faith traditions is that it's, it's, it's like it grounds you and connects you to this long lineage of thought and people chewing it over and that we then get the honor and the privilege and challenge of chewing it over for our current cultural ecosystem context, what have you. And that, that is the joy that there's not an answer. The, the practice is the joy itself. The questions are, are the practice, right? Um, and which is also a very Jewish perspective. It's all about questioning everything. (laughs) Yeah. I actually, I, you know, it's so hard. This, 
this is going to happen. So I just have to be totally vulnerable and honest about it, which is that one of the people that I followed in Christianity for a long time. So my story is I grew up in Dallas. So I was in the South and grew up in in, swimming in Christian culture, but I did not grow up in a Christian practicing family. Uh, and I had a kind of a pretty rough childhood. And so when I was in late high school, I, I was sort of desperate for like a real connection and something that felt, I don't know, healing. I don't know what it was. I, I remember at the time I just sort of described, like when I found some folks who were practicing Christianity, they were a particularly amazing set of people, mind you, in the midst of what I now know is a larger culture that can be really challenging, but these folks were incredible. And I just remember sort of thinking it felt like when I met them that a, a hole had been filled that I didn't even know existed. And so there was something there for me and, um, not long after that, I started following a guy named Rob Bell, which is, um, he used to be a pastor at this like mega church in, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I listen. I've listened to him since li- like truly like podcasts ever existed on Apple and iTunes back when they used to like record their sermons. And I would sit at work in Denver and I would like listen to all of their sermons every week. And so I've listened to him for a really long time. So he feels like a little bit like my rabbi that I, ha- I have followed him for a really long time. And he's very controversial in Christianity. He's controversial pretty much everywhere. Uh, because, uh, I think he years ago sort of came out with a sort of universalist leaning bent and that didn't go very well for evangelicals. Uh, and so things change a lot for him, but some of the things I love actually, in part of what I'm talking about with questions, his very first book he ever wrote, the first chapter is called questions. And he talks about how faith is not meant to be a brick wall where like it's built with all of your little like dogmas so that if any person removes one, it threatens to collapse the entire thing. It's meant to be more like a trampoline where you invite people on, which is where I think like invite, invite people on to like jump and experience it and have the joy and the, you know, that experience with you. So I've always loved that. And I also love, I can't remember. He has a documentary about him, I think is where I heard this and I'm going to have to do it off the top of my head. So I'll include it in the show notes more accurately, but it's something to the effect of, um, like doubt and questions uh, and that sort of thing aren't leaving the tradition. They are the tradition. And, and I think that that actually is, I, he comes from a sort of, he talks a lot about Judaism as it informs Christianity. And so it doesn't surprise me that your response is that's a very, you know, sort of Jewish sentiment, but I, yeah, I, I've always thought that was so beautiful. Like that, that is the, the work is just, and the, the pleasure is being able to chew things over with people and yeah. Um, I was going to say to Abra, oh, I really just, and I know that we've got to wrap up here soon. So I'll start asking you some closing questions in a second, but, um, I really resonated with what you said about, I think as a white person also who, who grew up in that culture in, you know, swimming in Christianity and then, you know, engaging with it very, very much when I was sort of in late high school and then on into college, when I came out a little bit later in life probably five years after I graduated college, um, you know, as a queer, I I of course then had to contend, I had to contend with the tensions of what I'd been taught. It was to be a queer person and also a person who had a faith. And then of, of course, you know, I had also begun to experience all the real challenges within Christianity. And so it's like, even you were saying, I think that, you know, permaculture, even we don't even have to talk about religion, but all of it can sort of like resemble a dogmatic or can be problematic or oppressive, you know, like anything can be sort of made that way. And so, and I think there was a period of time where it was really challenging because I didn't know a way to practice something that I still believed, even though I had sort of thrown like, like you, I was like, I don't know how to not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I know I'm, this still is core to who I am. So I don't really know how to engage with this in this way anymore. And it took a good 10 years probably of having to like, yeah, chew that over and, and disentangle some stuff that I had been taught. And now I feel like actually it's so weird. Like when you start doing your, like what feels like sort of your creative work in the world or how you really want to show up and you start doing that vulnerability and that practice or what have you, it's like all of a sudden those things became even more real. Like all of a sudden, yeah, the sort of trust in the universe and sort of woo things that people talk about now, all of a sudden things that I was taught in my faith tradition now 
are in a lot of ways more real. Like you're saying about like these practices of Shabbat and, you know, rest and all of those things that truth is truth, I guess, you know, and, and when it becomes really practical in your own life, I think that's when it really starts to hit you. And I think as a, a white person, who's now sort of at that place of learning how to integrate what still works for me and not take what doesn't, and also hopefully speak to what doesn't, because those are oppressive systems that the traditions of like going back to nature and, and I think even like Celtic Christianity stuff, that's been much more like ritualistic and, uh, nature-based and those sorts of things have been really meaningful to me and stuff I'm starting to explore. Uh, so thanks for sharing all those things. Yeah. And can I just make one link here between permaculture and Judaism? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, you know, I think as I became more critical of permaculture over the last 10 years, it actually paralleled my journey with Judaism. And while I wasn't raised in a conservative shul like Adam was, um, I really had to rebel and I dropped out of Hebrew school, didn't have my bat mitzvah until I was on my own terms when I was 36, my double high birthday. And I came back to Judaism in college um, through queer community and through like earth-based frameworks of Judaism through Ella Chaim, which is now at Isabella Friedman, but I was adjacent to it. And, um, it brought me in and I said, I don't have to throw everything of the tradition out, even though it's so patriarchal and can be so dogmatic. And likewise, you know, authoring a book on social permaculture feels like an edgy thing. Like I can definitely be up uh, against scrutiny of people saying, you know, this social justice um, touting author is also writing about something that has like um, a history of appropriation and is, you know, founded by these, these two white academic straight men in Australia and, and co-opting indigenous technologies and profiteering. Right. And so putting that out there, um, actually felt like a really powerful form of saying, uh, I'm, I'm not in one party or the other. How can much like Judaism, we evolve what we've been handed down? How can we create a syncretic new legacy to leave that is not just accepting, um, you know, what we've been handed without criticism, but also without making it better and evolving it. And so I feel like that's the way that my Judaism lands and writing regenerative design for change makers, a social permaculture guide was very much like, how can I take the best best of evolve it and ask other thought leaders to come in from uh, adjacent uh, fields of work to bring something together that is more whole and also more um, diverse in different in different angles and frameworks and voices. And so, yeah, I feel like there's a direct, it's not quite a fractal, but there's a parallel reinforcement in my journey with my Jewish identity and practice and how like permaculture and my book and um, social design at Regenerate Change has become such a central pillar of my life that uh, I'm not embarrassed to put out there because it does feel whole and in integrity with my values and ethics. Yeah. Going back to what Adam said earlier about that idea of integrity and being able to show up as your whole self, I think that's been that's definitely been a challenge and a tension I've been holding recently, right? As someone who grew up in that culture, sort of did what I could to defect from that culture and, and its harms as much as I could. And now sort of going, going back to it is the wrong word. <laughs> like, I just don't even know how to talk about it publicly yet. You know, I think this is just something I'm still exploring, especially as I just start doing this more public work that, uh, you know, I, I got really into like science and art a few years ago. And I was like, well, the real interesting thing to me is like science, art, and soul. Like, how do we connect those things? Because they're all really, really, we're just all asking similar questions. Why are we here? What does it matter? How does it affect our daily lives? Then how do we engage in the real world as we're here? And, you know, so I have a lot of folks who follow me who are science leading people. I'm like, well, how do I talk about these like mystical things? to people I know who are going to be like, no, this sucks. And so see, seeing, you know, to your point, Abra, about knowing all the harms that come with Christianity and faith in general of, you know, all stripes and being able to bring that in 
when people are going to perceive that through that lens, because it has been so harmful, right, rightfully so perceiving it through a particular lens, but also go like, yeah, how, how is it that I now integrate that into my work and not cut off this part of me that's real? It's like, it's still, it's re- as much as I would like to be like, well, I'm just going to talk about, you know, like conceptual things and I'm going to talk about science and art and creativity and all of that. But like the, the reality is that they intersect with my daily lived life, which means that they intersect, they intersect with like the mystical wild experiential things that I'm in practices and rituals and stuff that I'm, you know, I'm doing every day. So yeah, I, I really deeply resonate with that. It's a, it's a real interesting conundrum Hmm. or tension, I guess. Okay. So wrapping up, I guess. So I would love to hear you actually both say sort of who inspired you into this work. So I often call these, I I got the name from this, from another podcast, uh, called call your girlfriend, (laughs) but they talk about the idea of possibility models. So who were people in your lives that actually showed you these sorts of intersections and inspired you into doing this? And that this kind of like cross-disciplinary intersectional work was possible. Um, I can answer that in a few ways, but I think the first thing I'll say is that I don't, I don't know that I had too many like direct mentors, um, in, in this work because, you know, that this kind of, these intersections, I'm not going to say they're new because again, as we've been talking about this whole time, they've been explored since humans have been around, but, but this exact way of framing the intersection of permaculture and social change and all that, like I, I, I didn't connect with many people doing that until I was well into doing it myself. However, I think, um, certainly my peers are my possibility models. I feel like we are in a really, a uh, powerful spiral of abundance of like showing each other what's possible and like co-discovering what is the next step forward in this work and, uh, and inspiring each other with, with visions we have. And, you know, Abra is very much, uh, in, in that, uh, category for me, as well as my kind of social permaculture community here in Denver. Um, and then in another kind of completely different way, um, while we're, you know, talking about our, our ancestral traditions, I have been really feeling connected to my father's father's father, um, who, who I never met, you know, he died, I don't know, in the fifties or something. Um, but he was the one who made the journey from the old world to turtle Island. Um, he actually lived in Denver very briefly. He was in Tulsa during the 1921 race massacre. He owned like a small corner store. Uh, so he sold food and then formed like a food co-op, uh, with a bunch of different corner stores to like buy food, um, you know, to get good deals on food and to be able to compete with emerging supermarkets. Um, and, and just the more I learn about him, the more I see resonances in his story with mine and inspiration in his story, um, for where I'm trying to go. Love that. I'll answer real briefly, um, but I think, you know, in my formative years, in my early 20s, being exposed to poets, and and I am a Mm. poet myself. And I want to snap in response to that. Yeah, like (laughs) Saul Williams came to our college and and Michael Franti and my dear friends, Alixa Naima from Climbing Poetry. We all met when we were 24. And I think just the like using words to craft other worlds and call them forth and doing it in such a compelling and emotional art form um, helped me see that we can put disparate things together and actually create new realities. And so I think you know, those folks, along with many, many other thought leaders, have influenced me over the years. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there anything else that y'all would want to, uh, that we didn't cover that you'd want to make sure to say in our last few minutes together about fractals and free will or anything else? I think I'll just share that, um, my final published edition of my book will be out this October as a uh, resilience and adaptation response to having it, uh, canceled last year in the midst of the pandemic with my previous publishers. I have 
come forward with a self-published copy of the new edition yes. of regenerative design for change makers. And yeah, it will be out this October and there will be some accompanying uh, workshops that we launch in 2022 to be a compendium to the book. So yeah, really excited to um, share it more broadly with audiences that are receptive in the wake of so much disturbance from racial uprisings and the pandemic and just reckoning with uh, the go, go, go culture that so strongly came to a halt. And we all got to hopefully do some reflection and reevaluation. So may it be a fertile time to share with, with y'all out there who haven't had a chance to read it. And it will be a, a brand new edition of regenerative design for change makers. Yeah. And I'll make sure to include it in the show notes as well so that we can link out to that. Adam, any, any last things to promote or what have you, I will certainly link also to regenerate change, of course, and all your offerings. Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and I'll just say specifically, you know, the best way to be in community with, uh, with the group of people around the world who were kind of, uh, bringing together, convening to, to, uh, play with these ideas is, is on our regenerative change makers network, um, which has uh, over 300 people on it now and lots of different, um, questions and opportunities for collaboration and, um, cool dives into how living systems can inform our work as change makers. So yeah, great, great, great starting point. Great. Well, I will share all of that. Thank you for your time. And yeah, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for being in this conversation with me. Um, yeah. It has been so rich and stimulating. Thank you for calling us in Brandy and just so wonderful to the bring the three of our minds together. Ooh, okay. That conversation did a lot of things for me, but what I'm feeling right now is how Abra's practices are just inspiring me to really ritualize rest, you know, like reintegrating those quote unquote ancient technologies that we're trying to reincorporate into our lives, at least like pulling the things out that, that feel like we really want to still keep, even if we've gotten, you know, if we've sort of, um, sifted out some of the previous things. And I feel like the idea of Sabbath and ritual rest is just something that's, uh, really been, uh, something that has been coming up for me a lot lately. I love that part so much. But okay, Abra's uh, book, of course, as mentioned, uh, came out recently, and you can find it at abradresdale.com slash my dash book. I'm going to link to it in this episode's description and in the show notes for this conversation, so you can find it at both places. You can also join her for an upcoming virtual launch event on Tuesday, November 30th by clicking the registration link in the description of this episode as well, or in the episode show notes, again, like her book, find them both in those places. And then uh, you can find Regenerate Change online at regeneratechange.org. As always, thank you to the team at Upfire Digital for the audio processing. You can find them online at upfiredigital.com. And I do this work on the occupied land of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho people. I've mentioned before that this land acknowledgement is an important practice to me for various reasons. Um, and that I want to continue digging into how to do this acknowledgement better and better. And one thing that came up in this conversation with Adam and Abra was the concept of land back, which again, maybe strikes some folks as a new idea, but is in fact an ancient tradition. If you'd like to learn more about that, go to landback.org. I've also listed several other resources I found while I've been learning more about land acknowledgements in this episode's show notes. I really highly recommend you check them out. It was so informative and I hope to start incorporating more and more of those into this little portion of the show. Uh, but links to everything else as uh, that we talked about as usual are on my site, of course, including a link to a short history of nearly everything, which I mistakenly in this conversation called A Brief History of Nearly Everything. It's by Bill Bryson. I love that book. You can find me online otherwise at this plus that pod everywhere. Well, really only Instagram and Twitter, but find me at this plus that pod. And if you're a plus kind of person and you love this shit as much as I do, you can also sign up for my newsletter there. In it, you'll get inside peeks at important connections I'm making at the intersections of all of my interests, podcast announcements, additional commentary from me beyond these podcast conversations, and curated links to my favorite recent idea mashing people and media. 
Otherwise, as always, please do take a few seconds to rate and subscribe to the show. Rate and leave a review even if you could. It helps out so much. And tell other people you know about your love for this show. I love hearing about it. It's so fun. For now, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, I hope you are going to leave with me and considering and contemplating more of the connections between fractals and free will.